Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello, welcome to VO Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Douglas Simpoga, and here is what's coming up. More than 400 rebels accused of killing Chad's former president are sentenced to life in prison. And Muslims around the world mark the start of Ramadan. All this and more coming up on African News Tonight. Experts are linking the rise of extremist and terrorist groups in Africa to conditions like underdevelopment, distrust of governance, declining authority, readily available weapons and clumsy, heavy-handed and ineffective security forces. They argue that too often military action against extremists helps them recruit or leaves communities caught between their harsh actions and indiscriminate operations against them. Jerome Drabon, a senior analyst on jihad and modern conflicts, at the International Crisis Group, discuss these reasons with VOA senior analyst Mohamed Al Shanawi. Nearly all the groups that ultimately became affiliated to Islamic State existed before, and so they existed for usually non ideological reasons, regardless of what IS claims to, to be fighting for. So they were fighting because of their uh, local condition. So in uh, like in Nigeria, you had a wide antagonistic social movement that faced with repression that ultimately legitimized armed violence, became Boko Haram, and down the line became an uh, Islamic state. In the Sahel, you had you know, a failed process of state contraction that created legal uh, grievances that then intersected with the conflict in Algeria and Algerian militants sending their people there and trying to transform the conflict into a new conflict. So basically, groups like Islamic State or Qaeda exploited something that, that already existed to spread their agenda. But they wouldn't have had the success that they had without these local failures. The type of repression in cases perpetrated by, uh, by the security forces can reinforce their attractiveness in, to some extent and push people People to join the militants to fight back. Some of the weapons, for example, that uh, became more widespread after the war in Libya, you know, spread in the Sahel and conducted as well, led also to a worsening of the conflict there. And so all those environmental conditions basically you know, worsened the conflict and in some cases increased the attractiveness for, of these groups. But this cannot be isolated from also state actions. Too often military action against extremists helps them recruit or leaves communities caught between their harsh rule and indiscriminate operations against them. What's the best strategy to counter the expansion of terrorist and extremist groups in the African continent? One of the mistakes following the global war on terror was to assimilate these groups as something that's cohesive, that's interconnected, that works together. So it's often better to try to treat these groups individually and to try to weaken these transnational connections. Because the transnational connections makes the conflict much more difficult to solve. So the first approach is to weaken this link and to target or to address the conflict as such. We cannot say that military solutions will, will never be used. You know, military solutions can occasionally weaken these groups by weakening their leadership or internal cohesion and so on. I mean, we see that, for example, the, the U.S. has substantially you know, weakened the central leadership of, of Islamic State, for example, in Iraq and Syria, and is trying to prevent it from rebuilding. So military approaches do have some efficiency, but the risk would be to say that only military solutions solutions can work, or that military solutions are the only means that can be used to address this military. So the idea is also to try to combine some political means in addition to the military means, including reaching out potentially to some of these groups, trying to find a way to dissociate them from transnational movement, and potentially find some local agreements that could, you know, lead to the end of the conflict. So how would the French withdrawal from the Sahel facilitate an escalation of terrorist attacks in that region. The, the issue is if both the French withdrawal from the Sahel and its replacement by the private security firm Wagner. The replacement of the French by the private security firm Wagner somehow sends a signal that military solutions first will solve this, this conflict. But military solutions and the French large-scale involvement for the past decade did not solve the conflict. The group have become more powerful, more influential, and active in, in more countries. So it's very unlikely that by bringing foreign security firms whose actions 
might cause even more you know killings potentially massacres it might further worsen the conflict and increase the attractiveness of these groups who are would be willing to fight back against Wagner. That was uh, Jerome Draven, a senior analyst on jihad and modern conflicts at the International Crisis Group, speaking with VOA senior analyst Mohamed Al Shanawi. More than 400 rebels accused of killing Chad's former president have been sentenced to life in prison. The Associated Press says an appeals court convicted them of terrorism, using child soldiers, and undermining Chad's integrity and security. The month-long mass trial charged 454 members of the Rebel Front for Change and Concord which, with killing former President Idris Dhabi in 2021, two days after he won a sixth term in office. Two dozen defendants were acquitted. The AP says the leader of the group, Muhammad Mahmadi Ali, was also fined $30 million. Lawyers for the defendants say they will appeal. The Central Criminal Court in the UK has convicted a senior Nigerian politician and his wife um, found them guilty in a plot to illegally harvest a kidney from a Lagos street trader. The former deputy president of the Nigerian Senate, Ike Akweramadu, and wife Beatrice recruited the 21-year-old man to travel to London last year to provide a kidney to their 25-year-old daughter, Sonia. The victim was told he would be paid thousands of dollars to go to the UK capital to work. It's a criminal offense in the UK to reward someone with, ma- with money to donate an organ. According to the AP, the chief crown prosecutor described the case as horrific. Kenyan economists say newly arrived wheat imports from Ukraine could help ease hunger in drought-stricken areas and bring down high food prices. 30,000 tons of wheat arrived Monday under the UN-brokered Black Sea Grain Initiative, in which Russia agreed not to block Ukrainian grain shipments. But Russian President Vladimir Putin warned this week that Moscow could drop the deal within 60 days. Victoria Amunga reports from Nairobi, Kenya. The increased cost of cereal commodities such as wheat has left bakers like Harrison Kiai in the grip of higher wheat flour prices. Kiai says these days his profits are insignificant. He said prices of baking items like flour, sugar, when you compare to the last maybe two years, the cost was a bit down. So the challenges that we have right now is to increase the cost, which maybe the customer is not comfortable with because when you go to the market, the things have shot up. Harrison believes that recent wheat imports from Ukraine will help ease soaring flour prices. 30,000 tons of wheat from Ukraine arrived in Kenya this week. The consignment, which is part of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's grain from Ukraine humanitarian program, was shipped under the UN brokered Black Sea Grain Initiative. Andri Prevninki is the Ukrainian ambassador to Kenya. Our commitment to food security is in the fact that's okay, the ship is coming, and it's not the first ship coming to Africa, and not even the second one, and we are planning more ships to come. By the end of this year, we are going to deliver 5 million tons of grain to exclusively to African countries. But we should realize that as a result of Russian invasion, the crop in Ukraine went down. Ukrainian agricultural production and exports were severely disrupted by Russia's invasion and many African countries that rely heavily on Ukrainian grain and wheat have struggled with shortages of key goods and high food prices ever since. The Black Sea Grain Initiative agreed to last year is meant to allow Ukrainian food exports to reach foreign markets. However, Russian President Vladimir Putin warned this week that Russia could withdraw from the agreement unless exports of its own agricultural products are facilitated. Prior to the invasion, Kenya imported 2.4 million tons of wheat from Ukraine each year. Although the grain that arrived in Kenya could help ease hunger in drought-hit areas, economists say African governments must develop ways to reduce the reliance on such imports, like increasing local production. Without that, says economist Silas Omenda, countries like Kenya are at the mercy of outside events. We can do all these other things when it comes to our energy costs, yeah, which is now a catalyst to value addition. It's a nightmare. And also the reliance of uh, fertilizer importation, 
it has also exposed us to a vast effect of inflation in the global market, meaning that we don't have control over what happens in Ukraine and Russia. The UN World Food Programme says the disruption in food shipments from Ukraine and Russia has left some 345 million people facing food insecurity. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. You are listening to African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Simpoga in Washington. The White House today condemned Uganda's Anti-Homosexuality Act, joining other nations and international organizations that have denounced the legislation that Parliament overwhelmingly passed late Tuesday. VOA's Caravan Dam has more from Washington. The bill would criminalize anyone who publicly identifies as a homosexual or engages in homosexual acts in a country where gay people already face legal discrimination. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre called it one of the world's most extreme actions taken against the LGBTQI plus community. If the AHA is signed into law and enacted, it would impinge upon universal human rights, jeopardize progress in the fight against HIV AIDS, deter tourism and invest in Uganda and damage Uganda's international reputation. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby notes President Yoweri Museveni has the power to stop the bill from becoming law. Uh, this is the parliament passing it. It still has some process to go here. Um, we're, uh, we're certainly watching this real closely and uh, we would have to take a look at whether or not there might be um, Uh, repercussions that we would have to take perhaps in an economic uh, way uh, should this law actually get passed uh, and enacted. But in a recent speech, Museveni suggested he supports the legislation, accusing unnamed Western nations of, in his words, trying to impose their practices on other people. The U.N.'s High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, asked Museveni not to sign the bill. Ravina Shamdasani, spokesperson for his office in Geneva, says it would have negative impact on a society worldwide. Last-minute changes were made in the bill that initially included penalties of up to 10 years in prison for homosexual offenses. In the revised version that Parliament sent to Museveni for approval, so-called aggravated homosexuality would carry the death penalty. Aggravated homosexuality involves sexual relations by HIV-positive people, along with minors and other categories of people. Under the bill, a conviction for attempted aggravated homosexuality could bring a 14-year prison sentence. Carol Van Dam for VOA News, Washington. China's foreign ministry says it would like to work with Ghana to resolve its foreign debt. Spokesman, spokesman Wang Wenbin made the remark as Ghana's finance minister, Keno Foriata, is due to arrive in Beijing to discuss the issue. Reuters says Beijing is Ghana's largest bilateral creditor with loans of nearly $2 billion U.S. dollars. It says the country is struggling with its worst economic crisis in a generation and in December secured a $3 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund. Reuters says Ghana suspended payments on most of its foreign debt last year and is negotiating a resolution with private international bondholders. The United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF, says more than 10 million children in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger need humanitarian assistance because of escalating conflict in the central Sahel region. Mavi Sochere in Jauso, in the Ashanti region of Ghana, has more. UNICEF describes the current situation as dire as armed conflict has driven 2.7 million people from their homes. The Children's Agency says people are experiencing brutal attacks primarily in parts of Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. For instance, last year, militants attacked 58 water points in Burkina Faso. Nikki Barnett, UNICEF Regional Chief of Emergencies for West and Central Africa, says there has been a rapid increase in attacks by armed groups. She says of UNICEF's water tracks have been bent and storage facilities destroyed. She says there should be a much stronger humanitarian response to improve access to safe water, basic education, 
and health care. We see the same level of interest uh, from donor agencies even to support uh, life-saving treatment uh, for children that are already caught up in conflict. But also beyond that, we, we need to look at you know underlying access to services. Uh, some of these parts of the world are already uh, quite excluded. People don't have reliable access to, to services Things like health service, nutrition service, access to schools. We have a lot of children out of school. She says last year was particularly dangerous for children in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. She says compared with previous years, more children were killed by gunshot wounds and other conflict violence such as bombs. Various militant groups have been fighting governments across the Sahel for nearly a decade. There are fears the violence could spread. Um, increased use of, of improvised explosive devices, the so-called IEDs, or explosive remnants of war. So the conflict is becoming increasingly brutal and it's, it's multiplying at an exponential rate, which is why we're issuing this alarm and such is calling on, on everybody to do more to, to shine some light on the urgent needs uh, and the great violations against children in the Sahel. And now that these violent incidents are increasingly arriving also in the northern border areas uh, of the coastal countries in, in uh, Togo, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, we're afraid that this is going to be potentially replicated, these kinds of trends in those countries as well. She says over 20,000 people in the border triangle between the three countries of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger could be facing catastrophic levels of food insecurity as people are cut off from their livelihoods. Barnett says it is important to increase humanitarian assistance in the Central Sahel region and notes donors provided only about 25% of the $391 million requested. In Mali, you know, our education and health programs were less than a quarter funded. So we're, we're calling on our new member states and donors to take uh, the situation in the South seriously and to accord it the same level of attention that other emergencies, uh, other conflicts across the world get. She called on governments in the region to scale up investment into basic services such as health, education and nutrition to create a path towards peace and stability and Barnett called for all parties to the fighting to fulfill their obligations under international humanitarian and human rights laws and end attacks on children and their families. Reporting for VOA, this is Mavi Sotri in Draso in the Ashanti region of Ghana. VOA Africa is your trusted source for news, sports, entertainment, and music. Stay engaged with VOA Africa. We love to hear your voice. You can call us 24-7 on WhatsApp and leave a message. Leave comments, requests, or greetings. We may play your message on VOA Africa. Dial the international code PLUS1. Then 202 258 3076. VOA Africa is always happy to hear your voice. The number again is the international code plus one. Then 202 258 3076. Today marks the start of the Muslim holiday of Ramadan, a month-long period of prayer, dawn to dusk fasting, and spending time with the family and friends. It's one of the two biggest and holiest events on the Islamic calendar, a time to bring people closer to God. Ramadan ends with Eid al-Fitri, the feast of the breaking of the fast. I spoke with Nadia Taha, a VOA staffer, on the remaining and on the meaning of Ramadan. Hi, Nadia. Hi Douglas Ramadan Karim, uh, Allah Akram. Uh, today is the first day of the Holy Ramadan in all over the Muslim countries in the world. And I think is uh, the first day is the most significant day for all Muslim because you know the body already used to the like co- the coffee, the tea, and the food. But other than that, two days, three days, they're gonna use to it. Uh, the the idea of Ramadan is this time to put yourself with the poor people if you wherever you are rich this is the time you fast and you will like enjoy the food with the rest of your family also ramadan is most welcoming month 
This is the month where all the Muslim they give out money, they give out zakah, they will give out uh, food to the neighbors, food to the the poor people. And if you cannot fast, if you're sick, you have to get something called fidya to the people who are poor. Like you have to give like uh, five dollar a day to someone who fast, and then Allah for, for, will forgive you from Ramadan. Especially me being from Sudan, coming from country where people like almost 80% they fast. And for us, Ramadan is one, one of the most important months. People, they start preparing before Ramadan for weeks. Plus, we prepare our spice, we prepare our flour, we prepare like the dry meat and everything to be ready for Ramadan, even onions. Because when you're fasting, you will be like so tired to prepare everything. So you will sleep all day in the evening, you start cooking and you will mm -hmm. be ready for the Ramadan. Is it a bit different or a bit harder to observe Ramadan like say here in the U.S. compared to Muslim countries or back in Africa? I think uh, Ramadan, especially in U.S., uh, for me it's going to be like a little bit hard because life here is not back home. Because uh, considering being in a Muslim country, a lot of people, they get like, you can't work like full time. Here you work with the other people are not fasting the same time, eight hours. And you also not having like uh, time to like rest because the body on you and you are like hungry and you can't observe. You not be like ready to work. But uh, here you have to work and fast at the same time. And also you will see people eating in front of you. And even dressing, like, you know, us uh, as a Muslim girl, we need to dress in a different way. You have to cover your head. You need to dress like, uh, you know, in Islamic way just because of the Ramadan and fasting and it's a, it's, a, it's a religion month for us. But opposite here in the U.S., where the majority of the people are Christian, if you're fasting, you see people around you are not like the way you are. But we used to eat and it's good to like have one month where you have break from food and you have just a, a month for prayers. The World Bank says it has approved a new $7 billion partnership agreement with Egypt to boost private sector jobs, health and education services and adaptation to climate change. According to Reuters, the deal will entail $1 billion per year from the International Bank for the Construction and Development and International Finance Corporation. Reuters says the IFC said it would help develop desalination plants in Egypt through a public-private partnership deal. Egypt depends on the River Nile for most of its fresh water supplies, an arrangement that's threatened by climate change. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Douglas Simpoga in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our engineer Helen and our producer Mokbil Yarabom, thanks for choosing the Voice of America. Maxwell, host of Music Time in Africa. Join me every Saturday and Sunday for an hour of awesome African music. Wake up, dance this music. Like to stay on top of new music trends? Breakout artists? New releases? Maybe you just love the classic styles and artists of the past. Or simply the sound and feel of a good beat. Whatever your pleasure, you can get it every week right here on Music Time in Africa. So join me on your local FM station, Saturdays and Sundays at 1500 and 2000 UTC. VOA brings you the best in African music on the African beat. African beat showcases the latest and the greatest of contemporary African music.
from Bobo music to hip life, bonga flavor to sukus, Afrobeat and Dumbolo and Makosa to Kwaito. The African beat on VOA has it all. And it's happening right here, Mondays through Fridays at 090.